Welcome to Old South Meeting House. Um, I know that many of you here today are familiar faces, but I see some new faces as well. Um, my name is Erica Lindemood. I'm the Education Director here at Old South Meeting House. And um, let me now introduce uh, today's program. Today is December 5th, 1773. And I would like to introduce to you uh, George Inman. George is a young man. He was raised in Boston. He is currently a student at Harvard. And he is the nephew of a gentleman named John Rowe, who happens to be the ship owner of the Eleanor. And for those of you who may not know, the Eleanor uh, was the second ship to arrive with tea on board in Boston Harbor. And it just has arrived within the past two or three days. Um, and here we have Dr. Thomas Young. I imagine some of you may have heard of this gentleman. Uh, he is a close friend of Samuel Adams, um, and he's here representing the Sons of Liberty. He moved to Boston in 1766, not too long after the Stamp Act riots, and he moved here in order to be involved with matters of the common man, taxation, and tea. All right. Good to see you, my friends. Thank you for joining us here today at the Old South Meeting House. As Erica has said, my name is Dr. Thomas Young, and I am like all of you. I am a very concerned citizen. We are here today to discuss the violation of our natural rights as oh, Englishmen. Now. Our tea is being taxed by our sovereign, King George III. I'm sure many of you know this. Now this tax has been placed upon this tea, they say, to repay a debt that has been levied against us, a debt that we owe because of that seven years war against the French and Indians. <laughs> I maintain, however, this is a debt we have already repaid. And a continued tax upon this detested tea, simply too much to bear. Uh, come now, come now, pardon me to interrupt right now, but this detested tea of which you speak is actually a delight to the body in the senses. You yourself are a doctor, sir, or so you claim here uh. in Boston town. You yourself should know that this tea, it does contain medicinal qualities. Uh. Uh, physicians have spoken out saying that it helpeth with headaches, uh, might cure scurvies, colds, and expelleth infection. Well, unfortunately, we're not here concerned with the particular taste of your palate. You may enjoy the taste of this vile beverage, but your palate is not our concern. Oh, no. We are concerned with our rights. In 1765, King George saw fit to tax our letters, our newspapers, our pens, and our ink under that dreaded Stamp Act. And then having grown tired of taxing our papered goods, they next saw fit uh, to pinch our pewter candlesticks, our paint, our lead, our glass, our fabric, and our tea were all taxed under Lord Charles Townsend's name. Those detestable Townsend Acts, my friends. Uh, we shall not pay taxes here in the colonies, my friends. The Crown expects us to line their pockets and gild their carriages with the blood and the sweat of the colonies. I, for one, will not stand for it any longer. How dare you, sir? How dare you insult our king with such detestable speech? Uh, taxation is a necessary thing. Oh. Yes, especially these words coming from you. You and your sons of liberty who incite mobs mm. against honest merchants of Boston town. Uh, your treasonous thoughts will surely be the death of us all here in Boston. Mm. Our homeland. Uh, they allowed us to journey afar so that we might expand the ever-reaching kingdom of Great Britain. Uh, we used her resources, sir so that we might, well, found our new world. A new world, might I add, that is on loan to us by our crown. And yet, the crown denies this new world oh, representation God. in Parliament. Yes. Is this not contradictory to the Magna Carta, oh. the document on which all of our rights are based? Fire does you. it not imply that no English subject shall be taxed without the consent of their representatives in Parliament? Yes, sir, we but shall it does. not pay taxes on items we have rightfully purchased here in the colonies. If we pay taxes, it should be to our own colony to better the world we are currently living in, not to some far off land that cares not for us. Taxation without representation is tyranny. Tyranny, sir, tyranny is what you speak as if James Otis himself is among us right now. Tyranny, well, what of the actions of you 
locals that have taken against the king's royal army? Was it not this same army that protected us, this colony, from our enemies, the French, hmm. and their allies, the Indians? Sir, this protection, it must be paid for. And you speak as if you and your ruffians, they are the compatriots who protect Boston, that you are the true gentlemen of this city. No, sir. Men like Thomas Clark, Isaac Clark, should I say, those consignees, my good friend, Josiah Winslow, these men are only seeking to protect themselves, their businesses, and most of all, their families from the likes of you. The mob walked through Boston town uh, looking to only seek out vengeance. Was it not this same mob of which you so idolized that tore down the home of our royal governor, Thomas Hutchinson, a man who was given to us by our king? Mm. Yes, sir, you only use violence to make your voices heard as opposed to discussing them like true gentlemen should. Civilized gentlemen. Civilized yes. gentlemen. A civilized gentleman would see that the actions of king and parliament are deplorable. D uh, your incessant chatter, it's giving me quite the headache. It's clear to me that we shall never see eye to eye on this topic. Your lavish lifestyle remains undisturbed by the sale of British goods in the colonies, especially those being boycotted by the patriot cause. You wish to continue drinking your tea from the finest china money can buy. Uh, you may see like a refined gentleman on the outside, but your mind and your soul are tainted by the English devil himself. Well, I expect nothing else of you, a lowly son of liberty, to oh. begin insulting a man during a, well, civilized discussion, mm. but I cannot expect less from you. Uh, mm. Sir, I must also add that your own words seem to sicken me, so perhaps we should allow them to speak as well. You, the body of the people, are here for a reason, yes. to make your voices heard, so uh, where do you all stand on this matter? If anyone has any questions at this point in time, please do raise your hands, ask away, before we begin insulting each other yet again. Yes, we will. We're quite happy to yes. do so. Yes. All right, there, miss. Well, because you already have that representation ah. in Parliament. A virtual representation, if you will. Virtual uh, representation. In Parliament, there are members of which who do stand for the rights of the colonies. That Townsend, of which you spoke, uh, he's a man who once did. Men like Isaac Barre, uh, men like Edmund Burke, uh, soon to be Charles Fox, these men do speak on your behalf. And they always look out for the interests, not because you are colonists, but because you are all English, British citizens. Uh, so you have that representation men so desperately cry out for, just because the laws are being passed that you disagree with, you claim that you don't have that representation in Parliament, but I, I do assure you, it is granted to you all. Well, none of the men that are giving us virtual representation have been chosen by anybody here in the colonies. They have been hand-picked uh, by Parliament over there. And I would argue that Parliament is becoming a bit corrupt, being in the pockets of the East India Company. The recently passed Tea Act mandates that the United East India Company tea is the only tea that is allowed to be sold here in the colonies. And who among Parliament are shareholders in the East India Company tea, who is currently losing money? They expect the colonists to foot this bill, I say that is unjust. Well, any other questions here on floor? Yes, there is. Could I um, just bring the microphone up? Oh, microphone. Oh. Yes. What are those? What is that? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm scared. <laughs> Hi, I am Joanna. I'm from China. Uh, I know every country has tests, right? Tests. So I want to know why we should have tests and why. what's the difference between the uh, between America and other countries, Texas, about the bit, the differences. All right. Well, uh, perhaps, sir, I'll start with this one then? Yes, sure. All right. Well, the taxes here in the colonies. So in 1773, uh, New England, Massachusetts Bay Province that you're in right now were part of uh, the entire British Empire, Great Britain at the time. Uh, our taxes were either twofold. We taxed ourselves. Here in Boston town, we had our own to maintain our own fair city, something that I think the doctor and I both agree are necessary yes, in this indeed. town. They maintain protection for our own selves. They maintain the roads around us, and they maintain peacefulness. It's yes. required. But there's also taxes derived from our parliament. That would be like our higher government out there. Uh, and they are taxing us in these colonies. Now, our debate here is more so about 
well, do, do they have the right to tax the colony without having people from these colonies over in Parliament speaking for us? Yes. Or uh, should they have members living over there in England speaking on our behalf? Yeah. So the taxes here, uh, I cannot speak on what's happening in other countries at this time, uh, but there should be no different than others happening around yes. the world. And another big issue we have is that many of these taxes uh, are collected by customs officials, uh, men who work for the crown to collect these taxes. And a lot of the taxes we are going to be paying upon this tea, the taxes will go to pay their salaries rather than to pay uh, the infrastructure of Boston and the safety of Boston. So it's quite an issue we take great umbrage with. Very good question, though. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Applause is due. Yes, yes, yes. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Or? Oh, yes, there, miss. Oh. oh, hold on one second. We're going to pass along a this strange device to you. Looks like a log of wood, perhaps. Amplifying log of wood. Would any women have been taking part in the public discourse at that uh, time? There were women, the public discourse, women were active in interesting ways. Um, there are women who wrote in great lengths about these issues at the time. Uh, Abigail Adams later on would write that, remember the ladies, because women like her, Mercy Otis Warren, Phyllis Wheatley wrote to great lengths of the certain rights derived. Uh, those would be women who often support the patriotic side. Mm -hmm. uh, there also were women who were active in the boycotts you mentioned, a phrase not usually termed at this time, yes. but our non-importation agreement. Uh, to some, they might just signify uh, a small level of uh, a symbol of their spinning bees they'd have at the time, creating homespun as opposed to uh, shipping goods over. There's uh, linens, fine linens. But also, importantly, is creating some of the first infrastructure here in Boston. At this time, we did import so much of our linens uh, that to have ladies to do this, anyone to do this, you're finding manufacturing happening in a town that would often look outside to have that manufacturing. But beyond that, uh, even as far back as 1768, documents have been found uh, of boycotts of the non-importation agreement being signed where ladies' signatures are indeed upon that. Mm. Uh, so they're writing themselves just as much as men were at the time to stand by certain ideals. And in this case, oftentimes the ideals of the Sons of Liberty. Yes. And a lot of the, uh, uh, the Daughters of Liberty, as we would call them, although they probably weren't up here speaking at the town meetings, uh, as you said, they were helping in other ways, especially by uh, trying to find alternatives to tea. Tea was so uh, massively popular at the time, of course, especially with women. Uh, said that men would go off and uh, drink their beers at the taverns, and women would have tea parties at their mm -hmm. houses. To combat uh, importing the English tea, uh, they tried to make their own teas, the Liberty Teas, uh, which I heard were... Not that good. Uh, there's a lovely poem at the time written uh, and discusses how uh, uh, destroying your tea set to toss away. Um, oh, if I could remember it offhand right now, do you remember any bit of it? No. No, all right, well said. Uh, well, uh, they, they would have these little poems or limericks to remind ladies to be as active a member of this public uh, discourse as much as the men. Um, even beyond that, if you're to look inside a magic crystal ball and look to 1774, uh, the Edenton Tea Party, which these ladies drafted their own resolution of a boycott of a non-consumption of tea uh, amongst themselves with no influence whatsoever by any sort of male presence. Uh, so they were also just as important at that time. Thank you. Very nice question. Any other mm -hmm. questions right now? Any remaining minutes? Good, because I could ask one of you, Doctor. Yes. Doctor, you, sir, are not a Bostonian. No. Which is why I'm so concerned that you were down here in Boston town discussing matters of taxes and tea. You yourself are a man from Albany. Mm -hmm. You have admitted, as, as Eric had mentioned, in 1766, you moved to this fair city of Boston from New York. Yes. What brings you here today? Why are you so concerned? Do you have a right to say any of these matters? I was quite an active member in the Albany chapter of the Sons of Liberty, but after hearing news of the Stamp Act riots, led by Ebenezer McIntosh and the Sons of Liberty. I could tell that Boston was the place to make your voice heard in this matter. That it was in political tumult at the time. It's greatly attractive to me because, as you can tell, I like standing in front of people and shouting things. Uh, so that was greatly attractive to me. I could make my voice heard on these political matters. And at this time, a lot of the Sons of Liberty were trying to get the colonies united. I think uh, united we will stand together uh, against the oppression and tyranny of the English Empire. I would ask of you, though, uh, why your father uh, sent you here instead of coming himself and why he did not boycott any of these goods. You speak of having peaceful resolutions instead of these riots that have been occurring. Uh, would not uh, joining in on the boycott supported the colonial cause? No, sir. I, I'm not here to speak of my own father's business the way he conducts it. Ralph is a very strong man, Ralph Finman, which many people know here in Boston and also, more importantly, Cambridge. But I speak here on behalf of my uncle, John Rowe. 
Mm. Uh, John Rowe is not some son of liberty dog like you, though at times he has supported and mentions or, or certain ideals that you sons of liberty do. Mm -hmm. But he has always done so peacefully. In 1768, when he was part of the Committee of Merchants, he was one of the men who drafted one of the first boycotts of Boston, the non-importation agreement. And he put down that this non-importation was strictly out of reverence for our crown and for our British liberties as derived to us by our crown. Uh, also, it mentions that this non-importation agreement should last only for one year strictly just for one year, and solely for the fact of raising new revenues here in Boston town. The hope of it originally was so that, well, with uh, a lacking of money here in town, that people, instead of looking outwards to spend their wealth, mm. they can spend so in here. That hopefully we can urge you sons of liberty and you lower folk of Boston to have frugality, to not waste their money at the taverns and actually invest into worthwhile businesses. It did indeed work effectively, starting to aid Boston this time. And because it worked so well, of course, the Crown would want to insert themselves into this. I speak on their behalf right now. I speak on them. So, yes, they want to add these taxes to our tea because our own business here in Boston is doing so well. I would posit that ships owners, including your Uncle John Rowe, should be able to make their own decisions about what goods they would like to purchase and bring back to the colonies. Coming back to the East India Company tea, instead of holding an auction over in London as they normally do that captains and ships owners uh, would light a candle of one inch size have an auction for goods that were to be sold in the colonies wait for the candle to burn out and the highest bidder would take the goods this was not the case for this East India Company tea they hand selected merchants loyalist merchants to make sure this tea would be sold here in the colonies seven consignees are instructed to sell this tea and are there not over thousands of Bostonians thousands of merchants who should have a say in this matter nearly 16,000 people in Boston at the time yes mm. sir but what's your point uh, my point is that these merchants are not making their own decisions. They're being decided for us by the Crown, much like this virtual representation of the Parliament. But these consignees of which you speak, this seven or so, uh, these men are some of the most successful businessmen in Boston town. Andrew Oliver, for example, the, the Clark brothers, Winslow as well. These men, uh, they should be models for other merchants. Yes, we are starting with tea. Yes, we are having the tea uh, be sold by only a few merchants in Boston town. But after we have retained a revenue here in Boston after we've earned it over there for our crown what is to stop them from expanding these men are proprietors of Long Wharf as is men like John Hancock as is my uncle John Rowe who is also not a consignee and who has made no mention so far to me or many others that he is willing to destroy this tea although I will mention that he did well not want this ship the Dartmouth uh, uh, shipped all the way over to uh, his own wharf Rose Wharf and said he warped it over to Griffin's Wharf that does not speak of weakness, just that you sons of liberty, when not getting your way, will surely march upon that wharf and do something you will surely regret. Well, nobody said anything like that quite yet. Mm. I'm sure in the days to come we'll have several meetings here at the Old South to discuss what is to be done about this detested tea and these consignees of which you speak. Mm. We have petitioned them and we will petition them to meet us at the Liberty Tree and resign their consignee ships. I do not think they will do such a thing, though, have being in the pockets of the Crown. Yes, sir, I was going to say good luck with that. They mm. know exactly what you son to Liberty do when you gather people around that Liberty Tree, so-called. Mm. Um, any other questions amongst this the crowd today? Oh, up, in, up in the front here. <laughs> oh, hold on one second. The sound log is coming. Making her run laps. Right in the front here. Yes. It's from Joanna. Yes. Yes, uh, another question. I heard about my history teacher said about the tea party. I thought a tea party is just like have a tea. But actually, it's not a normal tea party. So can you tell me what is tea party? When is the time and where is the location and who is inside and what happened? Oh my goodness. I would hope there is no such thing as a tea party here in Boston town. That would be disastrous, actually. Yes, if there well, was a such a thing as the tea party, uh, it would be in the future. Uh, of today, but uh, it just the destruction yeah. of the tea, as you're uh, learning about the tea party, uh, uh, is what it's later called. Uh, we are uh, talking about destroying the tea. Yeah. The possibility, if nothing is done about this tea, uh, we will have to destroy it, uh, possibly by throwing it into Boston's harbor. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure later on, uh, quite a name for it that would come out would be the Boston Tea Party. 
in the uh, middle in the middle of the 1800s actually is when the phrase later would be coined of the Boston Tea Party but for now uh, men like John Adams in their own letters would refer to it as the destruction of the tea mm. uh, this would happen if we could all look in the future of course we cannot <laughs> uh, December 16th 1773. Yes. So really, only 11 days away from this very meeting. Yes. Um, the first ship that arrived with tea on board that Boston was protesting arrived on November 28th. So since that time, until the actual tea party, they were holding meetings trying their best to have these ships sailed back to England. Uh, this actually later would happen in two other colonies with tea being sent to them, New York and Philadelphia. They allowed their ships to regain some extra supplies to sail back across the Atlantic Ocean yes. and then return over there. Boston was not granted that solution. Yes. So instead, the dogs, the Sons of Liberty, decided the best solution here would be to destroy the tea, to dump it into the harbor. And uh, many men this night would recount that they were told that no tea must survive this night. When destroying it even, actually, some would recount that young boys were sweeping the decks clean of every ounce of tea, either out of a kindness to those ship owners who they just destroyed their property, or mostly out of the fact that they wanted to make sure every ounce was destroyed. Uh, so that would be that tea party of which we later speak, yeah. Uh, but yeah, th th it could be a bit confusing otherwise, because usually tea parties are considered peaceful things, and yes. actually great for the senses and the body, if I can remember. Although, uh, if we are looking into the future, yes. uh, uh, that being a peaceful activity was very important to the Sons of Liberty, as we have quite a riotous and raucous and violent, bloodthirsty past. Uh, this uh, one was supposed to be different. This was supposed to be a symbolic protest, and more importantly, a peaceful protest, to make sure that none of the ships were damaged, to make sure that none of these ships' owners were harmed, to make sure that the captains and crew were left out of it and, and kept safe. Uh, so that nobody was to be injured this night. It was a bit of change of pace for the Sons of Liberty. Well, as my uncle John wrote... Oh, yes, go ahead there first. Hold on. We're going we're gonna to get the, ah. the magic stick over to you. Must be from Salem. And not to interrupt, but I was wondering, why were the Bostonians um, opposed to letting the ships sail back to England? Uh, it was not the Bostonians or, that were opposed. Or the Sons of, Li the Sons of Liberty, or... Uh, Sir, you can actually speak on this one. It's a son of liberty yourself. Oh, yes. Uh, the, uh, we were not opposed to them being sent back. It was not uh, the people of Boston necessarily that were opposed to the ships being sent back. Uh, it was the people in charge. The customs official, especially Richard Harrison, uh, who was in charge of a lot of these decisions, he would not allow them to be sent back. We sent the owner of two of the ships, Francis Roach, to speak with him and petition him to see if these ships could be sent back. Uh, he, being a loyalist uh, and a customs collector, uh, could not agree to that. It would go against his orders from the Crown. So then our final solution was to ask our royal governor uh, to petition our royal governor to send these ships back, and he again denied this. Uh, so it was the people in charge. Well, sir, you also are skirting over something that's very important. You just say simply they denied it. Well, they have every reason to deny it. In the past, the Sons of Liberty had taken direct actions against the very men they were now pleading to have ships sailed back over there to England. Men like Richard Harrison were chased around Boston town, refused to be able to collect taxes like they were supposed to. Uh, men like Thomas Hutchinson, his home, before he was actually our governor, when he was lieutenant governor of Boston town, it was torn down by the Sons of Liberty, granted before you stood in this town, Boston, uh, before you stood here in 1765. So our lieutenant governor's home was torn down by these same men going to him, asking, begging him to have these ships sail back to England. I think it is only natural a man who is a rightful, logical man to deny these men that right. That they have denied him the right for peace, so he can deny them the right for their peace. It's true. So I was wondering, um, why in Philadelphia and New York did they let the boat sail back? Oh, all right. Well, perhaps we can send this over to any questions. There is one man we sent out, or the Sons of Liberty sent out, after the Boston Tea Party to ride to New York and Philadelphia. He did spread word. Who is this man? Does anyone know perhaps this man who rode down to New York and Philadelphia to spread the word of what happened, the destruction of the tea in Boston? I'll give you a hint. He's a man who's famous for a later ride in 1775. Paul Revere, yes. yes. Paul Revere uh, was one of the men supposedly down there that night destroying tea. And he would decide to ride along with the well, Sons of Liberty, would uh, send him down to New York. And then from there into Philadelphia to send word of what happened. Since the tea ships in New York and Philadelphia arrived later, uh, and there's a 20-day allowance to allow ships in Boston town before you have to legally unload their cargo, consider it a parking fee or whatnot. Uh, so because of that, um, he got there before the allowance had been given up. He said word that in Boston they had destroyed the tea. 
New York had even more tea in their ships uh, than Nancy, and Philadelphia inside the Polly had a good amount as well. And fearing the economic downfall destroying, in this case in Boston, was by modern values between 1.5 and $2 million worth of tea, they decided to send their ships back over there to England rather than eat the cost of destroying that much tea. Uh, between the four uh, major ports of Charleston, New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, was half a million pounds of tea shipped to the colonies. Uh, so we destroyed only around 90,000 pounds in Boston, though later Boston tea parties, or tea parties in general, destructions of teas would be inspired because of this night. Because Mr. Revere, uh, while well, spreading the word, word spread fast, others would take part in their own as well. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I think Any other questions? Anyone else like to speak into the magic stick? That's fine. I'm sure there are going to be plenty of meetings as well. Oh, we have another one. Yes. Okay. One more. Another question for me. I was wondering, uh, was there some of the monies that were ca uh, gained in the taxes um, spent in the colonies by the Crown, or was it all spent um, back in England? Uh, this direct tax would be going back to England at the time. We had our own local assembly taxes that would be given to Boston itself. So, uh, And also, the problem is, as you mentioned there, sir, that there was uh, some of these taxes were going directly to the salaries of those collecting it. Uh, those customs officials working for the crown. Uh, so th that's sort of how it was divided at the time. Yeah. Can you add to that? Yeah. No. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. I think. Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty of more meetings leading up to uh, yes. the final day. Uh, the Navigation Act allows these ships to be in the harbor for 20 days, and uh, December 17th will mark the 20th day. So if nothing happens by the 16th, I'm sure drastic measures will have to be taken. And hopefully we can see the rest of you at some later meetings, indeed. December 16th will be probably our most, well, and most important of all. Uh, so if you do have a chance, we'd love to see you down here, either inside this meeting hall itself, perhaps out there, standing out there, waiting amongst the crowds, and hopefully definitely not down there by the ships destroying any types of tea. That would be terrible, please. But if you do <laughs> want to do that, make sure you bring your mohawk disguises. Thank you. And thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for coming, thank my very friends. Much. Thank you. Take care. And be your disguises. <laughs>